Welcome to the International and Comparative Law Center Seminar Series 2015. We're absolutely delighted today to have with us Professor Randall Ray, not only Professor of Economics at the University of Mississippi, Kansas City, but also Senior Scholar at the Levy in uh, Economic Institute of Bard College. Uh, has a lot of accolades from the past. You can go on Wikipedia if you would like to find them. Today he's going to be talking on money, market theory, intellectual origins, and policy implications. And I would encourage you, if you're interested in that, you can find that in the Palgrave Dictionary, as well as check out his uh, primer on money market theory that came out in 2012, and I believe got reissued in 2015. So without further ado, Professor Randall Ray. Okay, well, thanks for the invitation and for you coming out. I guess we first started talking about this four years ago. It took a long time to arrange uh, to make it here. And what I uh, circulated was an entry I wrote for the new Paul Grave Dictionary of Economics. The idea is to sort of summarize modern money theory uh, for a general audience, um, not uh, strictly for economists. And first I'll just tell you a very brief personal history of this approach to economics. Uh, it began in the early 1990s the, when uh, the internet was relatively new. I guess we were talking earlier, uh, Al Gore had invented the internet, as you know. <laughs> um, a discussion group uh, online was created, maybe one of the first, maybe the first, I don't know. It was called Post-Keynesian Thought. And uh, Post-Keynesian economics follows John Maynard Keynes, and it's what we call a heterodox approach to economics. It's outside the mainstream. But all the, the top heterodox economists uh, around the world were on this uh, discussion group. And this guy came on, and he started saying things that um, on the surface seemed very strange, very bizarre. <clears throat> but uh, as I read his comments and thought about them, I could see that he was just using different terminology. That a lot of things he, were sa he was saying existed in various branches of heterodox economics. <clears throat> and so online, uh, he would say things, and most people would respond, this is crazy. And then a few of us sort of started catching on. We said, oh yeah, that sounds like, okay, I'm in Minsky. That sounds like George Frederick Knapp, and so on. And so he started communicating uh, with us. And one of the ideas he had um, that became very important uh, to opening up this new approach to economics is he was a hedge fund manager who specialized in trading bonds. And sometime in the early 1980s, he said, you know, the Fed sells bonds. We call it monetary policy. It's called an open market operation. And the Treasury sells bonds. We call that borrowing. We say it's part of fiscal policy. He said, functionally, they are identical. They're the same operation by the government, just two different branches, the central bank branch and the Treasury branch. But for the non-government sector, the impact is exactly the same. Okay, And so when he wrote that, it just opened up our minds. We say, we've been looking at government finance wrong. Okay? And virtually all economists have got it wrong. So I'll come back to that, explain <coughs> uh, why this was so important. Uh, he wrote a little, pan uh, well, a thick pamphlet called Soft Currency Economics. That was the first publication that started to lay out this mm -hmm. approach to um, economics and specifically to government finance. And um, then I wrote the book that uh, John mentioned, Understanding Modern Money, in 1998 that came out. And so that was the first academic publication of this approach to economics. Mm -hmm. And uh, we used to meet uh, every year uh, with Warren and we would say, how many people now understand what we're talking about? You know, it, it took about 
five years to get up to the fingers on one hand. <laughs> and 10 years, we were up to, we had to use both hands. Okay. Uh, it was very rough going, very slow. Um, until the blogosphere. Now, just when you go home tonight, Google modern money theory. You're going to get literally millions of hits. There are thousands of people around the world. Most of them not in academics. Okay? Uh, vast majority not economists. <clears throat> who could give a pretty good summary of what modern money theory is all about. So, and, and there actually are political movements now that call themselves modern money theory. Okay? For example, in Italy. There actually are several rival political that all call themselves modern money theory, um, which re reminds you of Monty Python. Right? <clears throat> so anyway, what I'm saying is it's just, it, it took off with the um, blogosphere. And uh, in 2012, I uh, wrote a book, I call it The Primer, so it's a modern money primer, where I tried to explain it to a non-academic audience, and uh, that has been updated in, for 2015. And I'm told the book is out. I don't have a copy because they mailed them all to Kansas City. Uh, but I think it is now for sale. Let me first summarize the basic conclusions. Then I'll very briefly go through what we call history of thought, that is, the intellectual origins of the ideas. Uh, because actually, most of what's in modern money theory is not new. It was just forgotten. It was lost. It was lost over the past 40 to 50 years. It got lost. Uh, and then finally, the policy implications. So I don't remember how many points there are, but uh, just these are the conclusions where the theory takes us. The first is that sovereign governments issue their own currency, and this makes a big difference. A sovereign currency issuer uh, can behave much differently from a sovereign currency user. You guys are all users. Okay? Uncle Sam is the issuer. It makes a big difference whether you're a user or an issuer. The <clears throat> sovereign government chooses the money of account. In the United States, we call it the dollar. Okay? In Canada, confusingly, they call it the dollar. In Australia, they call it the dollar. In the UK, they call it the pound, and so on. The unit of account. The sovereign then issues a currency denominated in the same unit of account. So in the United States, confusingly, we call little green pieces of paper dollars. Okay, we use the same term. Well, one is the currency. The other is the unit of account. Um, they impose taxes in the same currency. Okay, so you owe dollar taxes. They accept their own currency in payment of taxes. Okay. In the old days, you actually would deliver the currency to pay your taxes. Nowadays, mostly you do it electronically or maybe you write a check. Prices generally are denominated in the same money of account. Maybe not all prices, but most prices. Okay. Most of the time. Uh, contracts are written in the same money of account and enforced in courts in that money of account. Usually, not always. Um, when you have a sovereign currency, there is a spectrum of exchange rate regimes that you can choose among. And what we argue is that a floating exchange rate provides the most domestic policy space. You can manage your exchange rate, which is what China does. And that might reduce your domestic policy space. You can peg your exchange rate, which many countries do, they peg to the dollar. That further reduces policy space. You can adopt a foreign currency as your own currency. Some countries have dollarized. So Ecuador adopted the US dollar. That severely constrains domestic policy space. You can adopt a gold standard. Uh, you can adopt the euro. Okay. Those reduce your domestic
domestic policy space. So, if you want to maximize your domestic policy space, you adopt your own currency and you float. Okay? That will provide the maximum uh, domestic policy space. The um, problem with fixing your exchange rate is that you need the foreign currency that you have fixed to. Or if you're Ecuador, you actually need to get U.S. dollars. That constrains your domestic policy space because you have to operate your economy in a way that ensures a flow of dollars into your economy. Usually this means what you want is a trade surplus. If you want a trade surplus, you usually have to adopt some form of austerity. You have to keep wages low. You have to keep domestic aggregate demand low so that your population won't buy imports because you're trying to run a positive trade balance. That's why it reduces your domestic policy space. Now, a country like China today has an unassailable foreign currency reserve, $3 trillion of foreign currency. Even George Soros will not attack that. Okay, and part of the reason why they've accumulated that amount is because George Soros attacks countries that peg and don't have enough foreign currency reserve. Uh, George Soros brought down the United Kingdom. One guy brought him down. They had to abandon their peg. Okay? Um, so that is the danger and that is why your domestic policy space is reduced. You can't pursue things like full employment policy because full employment could lead to your wages rising and could lead to your population importing, which reduces your trade surplus. Someday, China will float their currency. Someday, China's trade balance will turn around, probably a lot sooner than what most people believe. Why? Because they, they are allowing their wages to rise. They actually have a policy of wage increases. And so they're not going to very long be a low-cost producer. So they will float their currency in order to protect their domestic policy space. That's a prediction, of course. And the economists uh, are often wrong, but <laughs> I, I think that that is what we're going to see. All right. Uh, finally, the final topic on sovereign currency. If you issue your own currency, you can't run out. Uncle Sam can't run out of his own currency. He never needs to borrow his own currency. And in fact, if you think about it, borrowing your own currency would make no sense. It would be like, you've written an IOU to your neighbor. I owe you a cup of sugar. And you find out you need another cup of sugar. Are you going to go try to borrow that IOU back from your neighbor in order to get another cup of sugar? No you're going to write another IOU. Okay? So I'll come back to this, but sovereign countries don't need to borrow their own currency. In fact, there's no balance sheet operation that you can show me in which someone borrows back their own IOU. Okay? And this was uh, Warren Mosler's brilliant observation. Bond sales are not a borrowing operation. There's something else entirely. So I'll come back to explain what that is. Now, sometimes countries borrow in foreign currency, okay? Uh, and you can borrow foreign currencies. Again, the problem with borrowing foreign currencies is that you have to pay back in the foreign currency. And so that will constrain your domestic policy space. So I would say almost always it's a bad idea for governments to issue debt in a foreign currency because that is similar to adopting a fixed exchange rate. You're going to have to operate your economy in such a way that you can get the foreign currency to service the debt. So it will constrain your policy space. Okay, the second point. Taxes drive the currency. This is a shorthand way of saying that that sovereign government that chooses a money of account and issues a currency in that money of account needs to create a demand for the currency. The way they do that is by imposing an involuntary obligation on the population, the citizens or subjects, depending on whether it's a democracy. They impose the tax or some other involuntary obligation 
in order to create a demand for the currency. Okay? Historically, the main obligations were fees and fines. But from the 19th century forward, taxes have become the most important obligation that you have to pay in your nation's own currency. From inception, if a government announces, we're going to have a new currency, we're going to call it the dollar. And here, I want to buy something from you with dollars. You would ask, but well, why do I want the dollars? Okay. The government says, ah, because you have to pay taxes at the end of the year. Okay. The obligation is necessary from inception in order to drive the currency, to create a demand for the currency. Now, what we say is that taxes are a sufficient condition. They might not be a necessary condition. Sufficient condition means that if you have to pay the tax in dollars, you will demand some dollars to pay the tax. So it will create a demand for the currency, at least up to the amount of the tax obligation. <coughs> Taxes might not be necessary to drive the currency. Okay, we can be agnostic on that. Uh, you might be able to come up with another explanation for why people would demand a currency even if there was no obligation that they had to pay in that currency. I haven't heard any. The typical answer I get is the dupa dope. Well, I accept currency because I think uh, Buffy Bob will accept it. That's dupa dope. I think I can pass it along to someone dumber than me. I'll accept the currency. That's the typical uh, explanation for why people accept U.S. dollars. We can dupe dopes with it. Okay? That's not satisfying to me. I think the reason we accept dollars is because a lot of Americans have to pay taxes in dollars. Um, but we can say that I. Uh, Taxes at least are sufficient, and they might even be necessary in order to drive a demand for the currency. Um, from inception, you can't pay your dollar tax unless the government has provided some dollars. What this means is the government needs to spend the dollars so that you can pay taxes. In other words, the logic tells us that the spending comes before the government can collect the taxes. Because you can't pay your taxes until you've got the dollars. If the dollars come from government spending, the government needs to spend before you can pay your tax. So logically, the government doesn't spend taxes. Logically, the government spends so you can pay taxes. The spending has to come first. What that means is taxes actually don't finance government spending. Okay. Now, of course, if the government has, has been spending for years and years and years, a lot of dollars can accumulate in the hands of the non-government sector. Okay, and so that you have accumulated dollars that you can pay taxes with. However, they all came from the government spending originally. So once we've developed a monetary economy and there's lots of dollars in circulation, then the, um, the, this logic becomes less apparent. You say, well, hold a second, I have a lot of dollars. I can pay my tax. I don't need to wait for the government to spend. But the government had to spend from inception in order to get the dollars into the economy so that taxes could be paid. The sovereign government that issued, oh, third point. The sovereign government that issues its own currency cannot be revenue constrained because it issues the dollars as it spends. If it wants to spend more, it issues more currency. It can't be revenue constrained. Um, it can't run out of its own currency. It does face constraints. The main constraint it faces is the resource constraint. It can run out of resources to buy. It can push up the prices of resources. So too much government spending can cause inflation, as people have long argued. 
but it can't cause insolvency. It can't cause insolvency of the government. It can't cause the government to run out. So the fourth point is, there is no solvency risk for a government that issues its own currency. There is no possibility of bankruptcy. When President Obama tells us that the U.S. government has run out of currency, he is misinformed. Can't happen. The U.S. government can always issue more. It's not possible to run out. There's no chance that running budget deficits, spending more than tax revenue, is going to bankrupt the United States government. Can't happen because we can always issue more. We can always make all payments as they come due. The, um, uh, second kind of constraint is that the government can put constraints on itself. The United States has a very bizarre constraint, the debt limit. Okay. No other country that I know of has one of these. Uh, so Congress imposes a debt limit on uh, the U.S. government. And uh, we've had this since 1913. Whenever we came up close to the debt limit in the past, Congress almost always, really without debate, raised the debt limit. So it never was an issue. It was a constraint that was never constraining. Okay? Uh, a few years ago, the Republicans decided to make it an issue to try to enforce policy changes that they want by saying we won't approve an increase of the debt limit. So it became a, a big political football, and we're going to hit it again. Okay, very soon. And so what I'm saying is you can impose a debt limit constraint, you can refuse to raise it, and you can force the government to default on its promise to pay interest on the outstanding government bonds and other promises. It can be forced to break its promise to Social Security recipients. Say, sorry, we hit the debt limit. We can no longer write the checks for your Social Security. But that's a self-imposed constraint. We can remove the constraint any time. Congress can either uh, raise the debt limit or just get rid of the stupid debt limit altogether and say, that was a bad idea. And it was a bad idea. And most other countries haven't imposed this kind of constraint. So what I'm saying is, you can impose constraints. Okay? But the market doesn't do it. Okay? There actually is no reason why the U.S. government can't continue to spend and meet its commitments, pay interest to the bondholders, and pay Social Security payments to the retirees, uh, simply by issuing more currency. Fifth, sovereign government doesn't need to borrow, and in fact really can't borrow its uh, own IOUs. Um, some people uh, think that the reason that the government is borrowing is because it needs to finance its deficits. But actually, the bond sales come after the government has deficit spent. The deficit spending creates the, what we call high-powered money, which is currency plus reserves, that is used to buy the government bonds. So this was the insight of Warren Mosler. Everyone knows that the reason the Fed sells bonds is to drain reserves out of the banking system. Okay, this is not controversial. Everyone accepts this. Okay, it's in every money and banking textbook. An open market sale is to drain reserves from the banking system. So Warren is sitting there and he's saying, but hold it, what happens when the Treasury sells bonds? It drains reserves from the banking system. Exactly the same. They are identical operations, just by different branches of government. And once he realized that, he said, then bond sales are not borrowing operations. It has nothing to do with borrowing. It has to do with draining reserves. Why do you need to drain the reserves? Because deficit spending means the government has credited more bank accounts than it debited. When the government spends, it credits bank accounts nowadays. When taxes are paid, the government debits bank accounts. That means if the government is spending more than taxing, it is net crediting bank accounts. It's increasing the recipient's bank account, and that bank's reserves at the Fed get credited. 
excess reserves in the banking system drive the overnight interest rate towards zero. Excess reserves drive interest rates down. The reason the Fed sells bonds is to drain the reserves out so it can keep the overnight rate, Fed funds rate, on target. So the purpose of bond sales is to allow the central bank to hit its interest rate target. And it doesn't matter whether it's the Treasury or the Fed. The problem for the Fed is that normally it has a very small stock of Treasuries. If the government is deficit spending, over the course of the year, it will be adding dollar for dollar reserves for every dollar of deficits. If you think back a couple years ago, the budget deficit was $1 trillion. A $1 trillion budget deficit will increase bank reserves by a trillion dollars, dollar for dollar. In normal times, banks held about $50 billion in reserves. Adding a trillion means a massive amount of excess reserves. You have to train them out. You do that by bond sales. Okay. So this is why the Fed has to coordinate with the Treasury and say, we need you to sell more bonds because we're running out. So the Treasury will sell bonds uh, that drain the reserves out of the system because the central bank doesn't issue bonds. Okay? We could envision different ways of draining the reserves. You could have your central bank issue the bonds rather than the Treasury. The point is it's not a borrowing operation. It's part of monetary policy. It's to allow the central bank to hit its interest rate target. Notice the logic here again is the spending comes first, then the bond sales. Spending goes first, then the tax receipts. The source of the currency is the government. The currency has to come first before you can collect the taxes or sell the bonds in order to drain the currency out of the system. Um, next point. Central banks are never really independent. They have to coordinate their operations with the Treasury. Okay, there are several reasons for this. One, I've just gone through. Every Monday morning, the Fed and Treasury talk. Okay? The Fed has a projection of what it thinks will be added to bank reserves. Okay? And this depends on how many people are going to cash their checks from the Treasury. How many welfare recipients and Social Security recipients recipients will cash their checks this week because that will lead to reserve credits. And how many taxes will be paid this week? You can imagine the week before April 15, a lot of taxes are paid. Okay, that means a lot of reserves will be drained out of the system. You might have to put some in, okay, which means the Fed will um, buy bonds instead of selling bonds. Anyway, they have to coordinate their operations because the federal government is by far the largest economic entity in the United States. Its impact on bank reserves is by far the largest of any entity. Okay? And if they didn't coordinate their operations, the Fed would be stuck with either adding or draining reserves to offset the Treasury by massive amounts every day, hundreds of millions of dollars every single day in order to make sure banks have the right amount of reserves. Um, the Fed is the Treasury's bank. Modern Treasuries don't spend by bringing wheelbarrows of cash up to buy the stuff that they're buying from contractors. They don't deliver wheelbarrows of cash to your home if you're a Social Security recipient. They use the banking system. So the Fed is the link between the Treasury and the entire banking system. The Fed makes and receives all payments for the Treasury. The Fed is the Treasury's bank. Okay? And for that reason, it can't be independent. This idea that somehow the Fed will prevent the Treasury from deficit spending by saying, no, sorry, no money in your account today, we're gonna bounce your checks, is not going to happen. Never has happened, never will happen. 
if the central bank started bouncing tr treasury checks because of insufficient funds, the president will call in the Fed and tell them, stop doing this. You're messing up the payment system, okay, the credibility of the U.S. government. It doesn't happen. So because they are responsible for making and receiving payments uh, from the Treasury, they can't be independent. They have to accommodate the Treasury, and they always do. And the um, uh, final reason I already went through has to do with the bond sales. So they've got to coordinate the bond sales and possibly bond purchases with the Treasury. The treasury doesn't buy bonds, but it retires bonds, which has the same effect as buying bonds. It has to coordinate with the Treasury to make sure banks have the right amount of reserves. The only real independence that central banks have is that they can set the overnight interest rate target without political pressure. Okay? They can't be called into Congress and told <coughs> what interest rate to set. I mean, they can be, but they are not. Congress has given them that independence. So they are free to set the uh, overnight interest rate and then uh, the uh, chairman of the Fed has to go to Congress sometimes and answer questions about it. Congress, if it wants to, could pass a law and say from now on the Fed funds rate will be 1% forever. And this is what the Fed must do. They can do that, but they're not likely to do that. So they're, they've granted them that amount of independence, but that's all there is to it. Okay, and I think uh, two more points. Um, for every surplus, there has to be a deficit. If you think about an economy that just has me and you, if I spend more than my income, by accounting identity, you must have spent less than yours. Okay? If we look at the uh, economy we're actually in, for, uh, because income in the aggregate has to equal spending in the aggregate. It must be true, again, by identity, that all of the surpluses of households, firms, and governments are equal to all the deficits run by other households, businesses, and governments. Okay? So it's very convenient to divide the economy up into sectors. And we can divide them up any way we want. You know, we could have uh, blonde-haired people and red-haired people and black-haired people and brown-haired people. The deficits of one of those sectors got to be matched by surpluses of the other ones, okay? That would be a silly division. So what we normally do is we say, let's take the private sector, households and firms taken together. Let's take the government sector all levels of government taken together. And then let's take the rest of the world. Okay? All other countries taken together. Okay? That's a convenient um, uh, breaking up of our economy. Again, this must hold true. If one of those sectors runs a deficit, at least one of the others must have a surplus. The normal situation for the United States is the private sector taken as a whole runs a surplus spends less than its income. And that makes sense. Why? Because households generally want to save for the future. They're saving for kids' college education, they're saving to buy a house, they're saving for retirement. So normally the private sector runs a surplus. The government sector taken as a whole almost always runs a deficit. Okay, you can go all the way back to 1789 uh, the U.S. government has run a deficit in all periods except for seven very short periods in which it ran surpluses. All other periods, it's run deficits. Okay. And the federal government deficits are big enough to more than offset the surpluses that are typically run by uh, lower levels of government. Okay. So that's the normal situation for the United States and uh, for most countries. Our rest of world sector runs a surplus against the United States since the days of Ronald Reagan. Okay. 
you, you hear about this as a trade deficit. Okay, we run a trade deficit with the rest of the world. Uh, more technically, it's the current account deficit. Our current account deficit is offset by the rest of the world's current account surplus. They run a surplus against us. So take these three things together, it balances identically. Okay, I can show you a picture, it's a mirror image. The surpluses run by the private sector, um, as well as by the rest of the world, are matched by the deficits of the U.S. government okay, since 1983. Before that, we actually ran current account surpluses, but they were pretty small, you could pretty much ignore them. What this means is that it is impossible, impossible from accounting for the U.S. private sector to run a surplus and for the U.S. government to run a surplus. Can't happen. Okay? It could only happen if we ran current account surpluses, but we don't. And we're not likely to in the, in the not even the near future, in the foreseeable future. We're not going to run current account surpluses. So if we want our private sector to save, which almost everyone thinks is a good idea, we must have our government running a deficit. Must. As I said, we've only had seven periods where the U.S. government did not run uh, deficits. The first six of those were followed by our only six depressions. The seventh was under President Clinton, followed by a severe recession, and then by the global financial collapse. Okay, so not a depression, but bad enough. Deficits are very bad for the U.S. private sector because we achieve them by having the private sector spend more than its income. For 10 years, the United States, uh, before 2007, for 10 years, the U.S. private sector was spending more than its income, going deeply into debt. And in my view, this is why we had the collapse. The last time the U.S. private sector ran deficits was in 1929, followed by the Great Depression. Private sector deficits are really hard. Uh, they're very destabilizing. So for every surplus, there has to be a deficit. Um, the, we can think of it this way, the federal government deficit provides the uh, private sector surplus in the United States and in most countries. Some countries run current account surpluses. They are able to run a balanced budget or even a government surplus without having their private sector deficit spending. But countries that either run balanced trade or current account deficits need their government to be running a deficit. That provides the saving for the private sector to accumulate net financial assets. Those net financial assets take the form of currency and government bonds. So you know in Times Square there used to be this debt clock, they moved it a little bit off Times Square, I'm not sure why. Uh, you've all seen it, right? You know what I'm talking about? The, the numbers are just flipping like this. It's showing the outstanding U.S. federal government debt. And it's supposed to scare the heck out of you, okay? Because it's increasing every minute of every day, right? Except during the Clinton years. Uh, you could just as well say, here is national savings of our private sector okay? uh, because the government deficit is creating the private sector savings and so it's not debt it's wealth the government's providing uh, creating our net financial wealth in the safest form there is u.s treasuries what the whole world wants that's what our government is doing for us last point um, if you've got your own currency you can't run at it. You can always afford to spend more. This means you can always afford full employment. 
you can always afford to hire the unemployed, to create jobs for the unemployed. So one of the policy implications of modern money theory is full employment is completely affordable. You can't run out. The potential danger is it could be inflationary. Okay, so we need to deal with that issue. But affordability, running out of money, as President Obama claims, we ran out of money. We would like to do more. Okay, during the global financial crisis, we had a stimulus package that lasted only two years. President Obama said, we would like to do more, but we just can't afford it. We've run out of money. Okay. The piggy bank is empty. Okay, this is false. Could have done a lot more. We could have. Rather than having 25 million people unemployed, we could have put them to work. We could afford it. Okay, so now uh, let me just quickly give the um, intellectual foundations of modern money theory. I'm not sure how much this will interest uh, you, you know, uh, dead economists' um, contributions that uh, they had made that were forgotten. Um, so the, uh, the areas that uh, modern money theory has adopted are um, work in the uh, past in the areas of credit, credit money, what's called the circuitist approach, endogenous money approach, um, functional finance, financial instability hypothesis, uh, and the state theory of money. So just very briefly, I'll talk about um, each one of those and the, the main contributors that we drew on. So the um, first is uh, George Frederick Knapp, uh, who wrote a book, The State Theory of Money. So what he argued is that we need to um, look at the role of the state in um, choosing the money of account and issuing currency in that uh, money of account. This was picked up by uh, John Maynard Keynes. Before he wrote the general theory, he wrote a two volume work called The Treaties on Money, 1930. And um, in that book, he explicitly credited Knapp. Uh, but he also, long before that, uh, Knapp wrote in German, it wasn't translated until 1924. But long before this, Keynes was the editor of the most important economics journal, even though he's a very young uh, man at the time, uh, the economic journal. Uh, he wrote a review of two articles published by, uh, written by the um, Queen's ambassador uh, to Washington, a guy named uh, Mitchell Innes, uh, who wrote a book on uh, imprisonment called Martyrdom, Martyrdom in Our Times. He's very opposed to uh, using prison to punish. And uh, beekeeping for the Queen. I guess it was her interest. Uh, his only other two publications. But he wrote two articles on money that were published in a banking law journal. They are the two best things ever written on money, in, in my opinion. Clearer than that. Keynes reviewed the first one, 1913, in the Economic Journal in 1914. He said, we might quibble with some of the arguments here, but the overall argument seems to me to be correct. And what Ennis did was he started off his article saying, here's what econom here's the story economists tell about money. And it's the very typical one that is still in every textbook. And if any of you took an economics course, you heard this before. You had Robinson Crusoe and Friday, they're on an island, they're bartering fish for coconuts, it's very inconvenient, so they decide to use seashells as a medium of exchange. So that's supposed to be the story of the origins of money. And he says that, that uh, this is all completely false. Okay, there is no evidence for this, and it's completely illogical. Okay. So instead, he presents a very different story of money that heavily influenced Keynes. Uh, in uh, the late teens, in 1919, 
Uh, Keynes had a period that he called his Babylonian madness, investigating what they knew at that time about the development of money in Babylonia. Okay, and. Uh, it is very similar to Knapp's story that it had to have come from the authorities. So Keynes spent this period studying the, the earliest money units and he was sort of surprised to find that the earliest money units, all of them that we know about always were weight units and they always were grain weight units. Uh, so the mina, the shekel, every early uh, money, the pound, the lira, uh, the term always was a weight unit. And so the hypothesis was that these came out of uh, record keeping by the authorities. Okay? Uh, and so, anyway, uh, Keynes picks this up and he says, uh, I'm going to quote just very briefly, uh, the state therefore comes in first of all is the authority of law which enforces the payment of the thing, so this is what I'm saying, the taxes, which corresponds to the name or description in the contracts. But it comes in doubly when in addition it claims the right to determine and declare what thing corresponds to the name and to vary its declaration from time to time, when that is to say it claims the right to re-edit the dictionary. The right, this right is claimed by all modern states and has been so claimed for some 4,000 years at least. So Keynes is pushing the origins of money back 4,000 years at least into the hands of the authorities. Not Robinson Crusoe and Friday. Okay. Not, it did not come out of markets. It wasn't a replacement for inconvenient barter. Okay. It had to do with authorities, who want to move resources to themselves, okay? Um, and the, uh, our understanding of the origins of money is better today than it was in Keynes' time because we've had more work by historians and by anthropologists. And uh, if anything, Keynes was um, uh, too conservative and only pushing it back 4,000 years. It looks like it goes back farther than that. It goes back to before writing. In fact, now the historians of the development of writing think that writing was invented to keep track of money. Okay? All the earliest writing is about debts. And so we're never going to discover the origins of money because we're not going to find, you know, the record. So, right, today I invented money, this is how I did it, and so on. Because money already existed before writing. So, there is speculation involved in it, but it certainly looks like it came out of the authorities. The, the best uh, explanation that uh, uh, I know of comes from Grierson, who was the most uh, famous uh, expert on coinage. Coinage, by the way, is not old. Coinage only goes back to about 700 BC. So money existed long before coins. Um, he argued that it probably came out of the tribal practice uh, that in the case of Germany is called the Vergeld. And that is the payment of fines. So in tribal society, if you injure somebody, you owe the family. And there's enforcement of the payment of the fine. So the hypothesis is that gradually over time, the authorities wanted to get some of that payment of the fine. And so now we say, you pay your debt to society. What does it mean? You pay the government, right? You don't pay the victims anymore, you pay the government. All of this is in Ennis. It's part of this is a, a critique of imprisonment. Anyway, uh, but what does that mean? It means money didn't come out of the market. It came out of the penal system. It came out of punishment. It came out of fees and fines and then taxes. Taxes are punishment. For what? Original sin. You're born guilty, okay? So what do we always say? You can escape everything except death and taxes. Uh, there's a lot more you can say about that. Good. It's all bound up in religion. 
almost all the terms, everything, everything that has to do with money and debt comes out of religion. The first authorities almost certainly were religious authorities that enforced these um, payments um, to themselves. So anyway, going back to money. What is it? It's record keeping. What is that green piece of paper? It's a record. What are wooden tally sticks, which is the way most kings of Europe spent? They issued a tally stick. It's record keeping. It is the debt of the issuer. And this is what Innes made very clear. All money is debt. It's the debt of the issuer. Okay? What do they promise you when they issue debt? They promise that you can redeem yourself in payment of that debt back to them. The issuers of debt must take it back. Okay? That is the promise of every issuer of debt. They must take back their own debt in payment. So what is currency? Currency is the debt of the government. The government must take it back in payment to the government. What is a bank deposit? A bank deposit is the uh, debt of your bank. They must take it back in payment of any debts you have to the bank. So you repay your loans with bank debt. So the same is true for all money. What is unique about the state's money is the state can put you into debt. Okay? You owe them taxes. Then they say, oh, here, here's my IOU. You can use this to pay your debt. Okay? So only the sovereign can put you involuntarily into debt. Uh, in uh, all the other cases, you are more or less voluntarily get in, getting into debt. And you can say, but hold it, I really needed that bank loan, right? But uh, there is at least some voluntariness in you choosing to become indebted to the bank. You don't have a choice whether to be indebted to the government. You owe taxes. So the um, uh, state's money is the state's debt. Coins are the debt of the treasury. Uh, paper money is the debt of the Fed, and the government ha has agreed to accept it back in payment to the um, government itself. Let's skip over some of these things. When we go around the world today, and we go back uh, through time, Keynes said 4,000 years at least, but probably now we can push that back to 6,000 years ago. Um, the typical case is, uh, as Charles Goodhart, who worked at the Bank of England at, and at the Treasury at one point, um, put it, one nation, one currency rule. This is the Goodhart rule. And it's almost always true. When you go back in time, you will find that each nation had its own currency. When you go around the world, you find it's typically true. When the Soviet Union broke up into pieces, each piece chose its own currency, which is uh, also typical. You will find historically exceptions to the rule where countries adopt a foreign currency for domestic use. Uh, you will find today a huge exception to the rule, Euroland. Okay. So Euroland is a big deviation. Uh, from what we see around the world and also back uh, through history. Um, but these are exceptions to the general rule that um, usually we have the state issuing its own currency from inception. Um, in modern economies, the State doesn't directly spend the currency, as I was saying. The central bank um, stands there to make and receive payments for the treasury. So it really will be reserves that are created, which are the liability of the Fed, rather than green paper notes, which is the liability of the Fed. The central bank 
um, stands ready to supply and drain reserves in order to keep its uh, interest rate on target. And this uh, idea was adopted in the endogenous money approach from the uh, late 1970s. Uh, Post Keynesians were arguing that central banks can't control the money supply. And what they mean by that is the money that is created by banks. They argued that when banks have good customers come in that look credit worthy, that want to take out loans, what the banks do is they credit their demand deposits, which is the bank liability. And that the idea that the central bank can constrain that by constraining reserves is just wrong. It doesn't understand the way that central banks actually have to operate. If they want to hit an overnight rate target, they have to supply the reserves that the banking system needs. If they want the payment system to function um, smoothly, they have to supply the reserves that banks need for clearing. So actually, banks can't constrain, central banks can't constrain the quantity of reserves. They need to supply it on demand. In the 80s, when Post Keynes is writing this, um, this was very much against the mainstream, in which the, the mainstream argues central bankers uh, can and do control the quantity of money. There's something called a deposit multiplier, so the banks can multiply the quantity of reserves, but the central bank can always control it. Over time, this view that central banks actually can't control the money supply has come to be accepted by um, virtually everyone who studies central banking and by central bankers themselves. So, for example, last year the Bank of England put out a piece that says central banks cannot control the quantity of money. What we do is we set interest rates. So out of the various heterodox approaches that modern uh, money theory was built on, um, this piece became widely accepted uh, within the past 20 years. The other pieces, not so widely accepted. The uh, next um, uh, early precursor is Abba Lerner, who developed what he called the functional finance approach. And he counterposed this to the sound finance approach. The sound finance approach basically sees the government budget as being similar to a household budget. And this is you know, widely uh, accepted. You hear politicians all the time saying, if I ran my household the way that Uncle Sam runs his budget, I would go broke, which is true. Okay? Households cannot continually deficit spend. Okay, they will go bankrupt. Um, Abba Lerner said, but this doesn't apply to a sovereign government that issues its own currency. It cannot go bankrupt. And in fact, it should not run its budget the way a household runs its budget. Because its interest is the public interest. Okay? And balancing the budget, the government budget, has no obvious public purpose to it. Okay? The, the government can and should um, run its budget differently, okay? And this is what he means by it should be a functional finance approach. Try to pursue the public interest. Well, what's the public interest? I've learned said that the two uh, most important things the government can do is to pursue full employment and relative price stability. And what that means is that you use the budget in order to achieve full employment. If there's unemployment, either taxes are too high or spending is too low. So you need to adjust those. You need to increase spending um, and reduce taxes in order to move the economy to full employment. Of course, if spending is too high and taxes are too low, you go beyond full employment, you get inflation. So the solution to that is to uh, reduce spending and raise taxes. So this is functional finance. 
That is his fiscal policy recommendation. His monetary policy recommendation is that if the public has too much money, then the government ought to supply more bonds. If the public doesn't have enough money, the government ought to supply fewer bonds. You can see that this is very similar to what I was arguing before. The purpose of bond sales is to drain excess reserves out of the banking system. Okay, the purpose of bond purchases is to put reserves into the banking system. So this is exactly what Abel Lerner was recommending for monetary policy. In other words, you want to hit an interest rate target and you make sure that the banking system has the right amount of reserves. Um, Beardsley Rummel, which is a great name, uh, was the uh, president, no, sorry, the, the uh, name of the office in uh, the 1940s was chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. We changed it, they're now presidents. The chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. And he's also the father of income tax withholding. I uh, wrote two interesting papers at the end of World War II in 1946. One of them was titled, um, Taxes for Revenue Are Obsolete. The purpose of taxes is not to raise revenue for the government. Okay? He says in the paper, World War II has taught us the government doesn't need tax revenue to spend. Okay. How did it teach us that? Because during World War II, the budget deficit was 25% of GDP. Okay. That's five times bigger than it is now as a percent of GDP. The government was 50% of GDP. The government debt ratio was 100% of GDP. Okay? He says, we learned in World War II, we don't need tax revenue to spend. Okay? Um, taxes serve other purposes. You can use taxes to fight inflation. You can use taxes to punish bad behavior. You can use taxes to change behavior. You can use taxes to uh, reduce the income of the rich. But taxes are not for revenue. This is the chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank in New York. Uh, Hyman Minsky, uh, who was my dissertation advisor, uh, was famous for financial instability hypothesis. So this is also incorporated um, within modern money theory. The most famous line from Minsky is, stability is destabilizing. Okay. So if the economy appears to be operating in a very stable manner, the problem is that people will change their behavior. They will assume that it's safe to take more risk. As they take more risk, the stability disappears and you get a financial crisis. Okay, so in one sense, that's the, the uh, theory. And so by using the, the understanding of sovereign currency, okay, which came from NAB, Innis, Goodhart, and so on. Uh, we were able to, beginning in 1992, uh, to write about the coming crisis in Euro land. That the way that the Euro was set up by trying to divorce fiscal policy from the sovereign currency, as each country adopted a foreign currency called the Euro, we said that um, this system will not be able to deal with its first serious financial crisis. And then following Minsky, we said, aha, we have our chairman, Greenspan, and Bernanke famous for eliminating risk. Okay? It, when uh, Greenspan was the chair of the Fed, we said, oh, there's the Greenspan put. In other words, you can go ahead and take all the risk you want because you know that no matter what happens, Greenspan won't allow anybody to fail. Bernanke even wrote a paper called The Great Moderation. Central bankers know what they're doing now, you can trust us, therefore there is no risk anymore. Financial crises are a thing of the past, we're not going to have them anymore. Okay? So we said, you know, this is exactly what Minsky was talking about. The stability will create the instability. So we said, we're going to have a major financial crisis, compounded by the Clinton budget surpluses that put the private sector so heavily in debt, 
by the deregulation pushed by Greenspan, Larry Summers, Bob Rubin, uh, we're going to have a massive financial crisis, which the U.S. will be able to deal with because we're a sovereign currency. Euroland will not be able to deal with it. Okay? They will face a crisis they cannot get out of. And so in addition to the creation of the blogosphere, being right about these two things you know, also um, increased the credibility of the um, modern money theory. The, the last piece uh, in the um, uh, history of thought that led to the development of modern money theory is the idea of employer of last resort. So Abel Lerner says if there is any unemployment at all, it can be eliminated by the government spending more. Now, the problem is that you can get inflation. Lerner thought you get inflation only when you get, go beyond full employment. Now, in the 60s, he changed his mind on this. But writing in the 40s, his prescription was just spend more. Okay? The problem is we get inflation long before we get to full employment. And so the government has to cut back its spending, raise taxes, slow down the economy before we ever get to full employment. So Hyman Minsky, who's known for financial instability, in the 1960s worked to develop a proposal of employer of last resort. So he argued that only the government can afford to hire all the unemployed. And so it must be the government's responsibility in order to maintain full employment. And we do that with what we now call a job guarantee. He called it employer of last resort. So what you want to do is design a New Deal's style jobs program in which the government takes workers as they are, pays them a wage which will become the minimum wage throughout the economy. Hopefully it's a living wage. And then finds useful things for people to do. Just as the New Deal jobs program did. I, I know that you're all young and maybe you don't know too much about this, 13 million people were employed in the New Deal jobs program. The biggest was the WPA, which employed 8 million people. Uh, you can still see the output of these workers all over the country. They built thousands of schools. They built uh, probably tens of thousands of bridges, hundreds of thousands of miles of road. They uh, built public buildings all over the United States. They brought a country that was a developing nation into the 20th century. It's not an exaggeration to say that they developed America. They made America a developed nation, the, the New Deal jobs program. So this is what Minsky had in mind uh, when he talked about it. I won't go any more into the, the, the you know, tiny details of how you run the program, uh, to make sure that it is not inflationary. But uh, Minsky argued this path to full employment will not cause inflation, whereas just having the government spend more could be inflationary long before full employment. Okay, so anyway, those are the, the foundations. To just quickly conclude, the policy implications are, first, we need to stop saying we can't afford things. We can always afford it. Okay? Uh, there probably are a lot of spending uh, proposals that are bad ideas. Okay? So we, we can always afford to spend, but we need to, uh, to spend on things that make sense. We need to spend in a way that is not inflationary. Um, we need to leave enough of the resources for the private pursuit of private interests. Okay. Americans like a small government, so I'm not necessarily arguing for a, a bigger government than we have now. Um, we need to uh, preserve a large private space, but it doesn't make sense to leave resources unemployed. If the private sector doesn't want to employ them, we ought to be employing them. And there are things that the private sector cannot do, um, such as public infrastructure, which is uh, much of that is not profitable. So this needs to be undertaken by the government. 
Um, the second uh, implication is, you know, we need to stop uh, talking about the central <coughs> bank as if it were um, completely independent of government. It's not, and it should not be. It's a branch of government. Uh, it has um, some uh, independence, but every uh, department of government has some independence. We want them to be independent of, you know, the day-to-day -day, uh, uh, political games that can be played, and it's very good that we insulate our policymakers from uh, that. But they are not independent of Congress. They were created by Congress. They're a creature of Congress, and Congress can change the laws if they don't like what the Fed is doing. Um, let's see. We need to um, understand that balance is balance. And it would seem like this is an obvious thing to state that at the aggregate level, the surpluses have to equal the deficits. But in 1999, there's a, the front page of the Wall Street Journal. I could show you uh, if I had the PowerPoint. On the left-hand column, there's a graph which shows the uh, government sector running a surplus, and they, the headline is, isn't this great? For the first time since 1929, the U.S. government is adding to national saving by running a budget surplus. They show the picture. Then on the right-hand side, they show the private sector, okay? And of course, it's running a deficit. And the headline is, isn't it terrible? The private sector now is running a deficit, reducing national saving, okay? There's no mention in either of the articles to the other article that it's an identity. You can't have the government sector running a surplus without the private sector running a deficit. So if we understood this, a lot of nonsense um, would disappear from public debates. Okay? If you like private sector saving and accumulation of wealth, then you love budget deficits. Okay? Because it's the other side of the coin. It's the mirror image of the private sector saving. And so uh, we would, you know, uh, I think, if people understood this, we could change the nature of the debate about deficits and debt and whether government debt is a bad thing, whether it burdens the future generations and all that, because it's all based on not understanding that the balances have to balance, that the deficits accumulate to private sector accumulation of wealth, which most people think is a um, good thing. Yeah, I don't know what time it is, I have no kind, uh, no watch. Whenever you know, well, it might be good to take questions. So, what let's thank Randall Ray for <laughs> coming. So, why don't, why don't we do this? Anyone who needs to leave for a, a class or has anything, it can leave, and we'll go for 10 minutes, Randall, and ask whatever you want. Let's go till five till for anybody uh, who wants to stay. We'll, so, we got about 12 13 minutes, and then we'll cut the video and we'll go there. I'm just, and what I thought we could do is we could, thank you, sir. We could just sort of like maybe have a few questions and then you could decide how to field it. Maybe I'll write them down. All right. Does anyone, so I've got, I'm going to, I'll okay. leave one and then Gordon's got one. Does anyone else want to ask one? Rich definitely <laughs> will. All the old professors. All of Thanks. us have finished. Old, old professors? <laughs> I'm going to just throw myself in there for me. feel good about myself. So I just have, here's, here's my question, but we'll just go around. So, uh, and this is speaking as someone who's, I wouldn't even say a novice, really just learning. Like for me, this talk was beautiful and like putting a lot of things together in a nice package for me. So first is, one is, well, so just thinking in terms of, you made a statement about a, a state cannot go insolvent. Well, what, I can imagine a situation where a state uh, dissolves. So the state literally stops being a state. So that might be a, a way of talking about insolvency. Like, and that could be due to political pressures that take the form of economic stuff. Like if, if Greece had gone another, you know, something like that. So I'd like to, so that's my first question to you. How would you engage that? 
And then the uh, the second uh, the second question I have for you, side of three. The second is uh, it, this seems like so logical. You put this to someone. It's very difficult to think how someone doesn't at least internalize a number of these points. So what is it in the social social epistemology of economics or something that's stopping people from doing this other than just <coughs> sort of like humanist arguments of, oh, you know, it's blind or, oh, it's just corruption or... And then my third question for you is, uh, you talked uh, about the idea of taxes as punitive. For me, it just blew me away to think about the theological nature of that. And you talked about how there's a, and we talked there's a ranking of taxes and, and the worst type of taxes and, and like how that hierarchy. Would you be able to share just a little bit of, of that conversation, which is fascinating about thinking about how taxes would be levied? Okay. Thank you, Randy. Jordan, you're up. Uh, how much of the misunderstanding do you think comes from? Uh, well, intentional misunderstanding. Uh, I unfortunately, or fortunately, sometimes I begin to think unfortunately, I've read a lot of history, and I haven't seen much indication uh, that people in power really give uh, much uh, concern to little folks. Uh, they tend to give most of their concern gaining more wealth and power. And uh, given the fact that, uh, you know, beginning very early with the pharaohs claiming to be god kings and owning the entire land of the nation. Just wondering really uh, how that plays into what you see going on in the current economic uh, debate, because I'm quite suspicious uh, that folks uh, who are shown things that are so unequivocally uh, true and obvious and refuse to acknowledge them have got some other motive. I have the World War II example. Because I, I, I keep thinking about the third person. You're talking about the government surplus and the private sector. But you also say there's the international, the rest of the world. You know, as you mentioned, China has this three trillion surplus. So I go back to World War II. But for the fact that every other economy in the world was destroyed during the war, thereby allowing the United States to operate on a tremendous trade surplus, if there hadn't been a war, Theoretically, all that debt that we acquired, couldn't, couldn't you reach a point where a country that depends on imported goods to function no longer has a currency that another country will receive and therefore is the equivalent of insolvency? Because they can't buy, no matter how much currency they issue, they can't buy the things necessary to continue to function. Doesn't I mean, that third party is what, is what concerns me. That's it. Okay. All right, I guess I'll try to go in order. Um, so currency sovereignty is only one dimension of sovereignty. Right? So yeah, governments can lose legitimacy and um, uh, dissolve and disappear. Um, so uh, we need uh, to have many other aspects of sovereignty, right? And currency sovereignty is just one of them. It's a very important one because it's the way that states move most of their resources to themselves. There are other ways to do it. The draft is one, uh, and uh, charity is another. Uh, we, you, We've used both in the United States. Uh, the draft wasn't too popular. And the charity doesn't work. I mean, it, every time you file your taxes, you have a chance to reduce the government's debt, you know. And I don't know how much the government gets from that. <laughs> I think it's hilarious. Uh, and I think probably most people do too. They never check it and they never <laughs> contribute. Uh, anyway, so um, yes, governments can disappear. And uh, too much spending could be a reason. Uh, so too much spending will cause inflation. And I don't think that that actually explains the hyperinflation. So the, the story is always about Weimar and Zimbabwe are that the problem was 
the government caused hyperinflation. I think this is completely false. And there are several good analyses of both of these situations that show that that actually was not the cause of the hyperinflation. It will be true that the government will be printing a lot of money and spending a lot. Why? Because all the prices are rising really fast. And the deficits will be pretty big. But that's an effect of very high inflation, not the cause of the um, inflation in both of those cases. But government can spend too much. Uh, government can spend on the wrong things. Uh, taking resources away from the private sector, bidding against the private sector, causing inflation. So that could be a big problem, and it could be the reason why they lose legitimacy and maybe get overthrown or invaded. And once you're overthrown or invaded, yeah, probably the currency is going to be valueless. Which, by the way, is uh, part of the story uh, of the gold standard. My uh, view is that the, the reason why we went through this period when governments issued gold coins uh, was um, because it was the, the era of um, conquest, so getting the gold, uh, of fighting each other, of hiring mercenary armies, who were not going to accept IOUs because you're fighting for a country, first, you really could care less about them, but second, they could well lose, in which case currency would have no value. So you demanded gold coins, which couldn't fall below the value of gold. So it all made sense, right? Um, so anyway, yeah, if, you, if you're worried about the, the state surviving, you're not going to accept IOUs. Uh, well, there's less incentive. Because the, the study of the Confederacy actually is really interesting because you would think uh, that as the outlook got more and more dire, the um, uh, Confederacy would have had greater and greater trouble issuing currency and having people accept it and, turn, and bonds too. Turn out not to be true. So patriotism may, you know, offset all that. Second, um, obvious. Yeah, it seems, and I, I'm not just putting down economists, there's a reason for it. It seems more obvious to people who haven't studied economics. And th there's a reason, because economics, uh, the study of economics um, changes the way you view the world and makes it harder to understand what I'm talking about. And so, it's much easier to explain all of this to anyone who works in financial markets. They're very easy. You know, they, they see it usually very quickly. Uh, when you say bonds are a reserve drain, you think about it for 10 seconds and say, yeah, you're right. <laughs> you know, because they know, they, they know how the market works. Um, economists don't actually know much at all about the markets, about financial markets, about uh, Macroeconomics. Macroeconomics is not taught anymore in the prestigious institutions. There aren't any macroeconomists. If you um, study macroeconomics at a Harvard or MIT, your textbook in the macroeconomics course, not the micro, will be about the representative agent. Your economy has one guy in it and he's maximizing utility through time. That's macroeconomics now, okay? So they don't actually learn any macroeconomics. They don't learn macro accounting, and they don't learn balance sheets. Um, it's a chronic problem. When, when I was Minsky's student, I would come to, uh, to him to try to discuss something, and he would say, hold it a second. He'd say, go, go back to your office and go through all the balance sheets, then come back and talk to me. And very few economists can do a balance sheet. It's funny if you uh, watch them try to do it. I'm talking about even post-Keynesians, heterodox economists. Get up on the blackboard, put the assets on the right-hand side. And it's, just, it's hilarious. Um, so I think that that is uh, part of the problem. Um, then, uh, also related uh, to your question, there, there probably are also reasons why they don't want to understand it. So I think that that is a big problem. Um, 
that uh, so when you talk to policymakers, um, it seems like the all the op the top operations people at a central bank probably understand all this. The in the U.S. we have this sort of strange. Uh, way that we select the the head of the Fed. Okay, so a lot of times these people don't really know much at all about financial markets. So you got Ben Bernanke um, who I think learned a lot on the job but going in he didn't know much. And it's a, a strange system where you select a, um, uh, someone from completely outside the financial sector to head, head the head of the financial sector. Uh, we've got um, political appointees that are heading the Fed. And so I think that um, they probably really don't understand much. But I also think that part of the problem is in how you explain it. And I think that we're guilty for not always being good at explaining. So over 20 years, we've gotten better at explaining it. And the, um, uh, it, and it probably still can be improved a lot. When I wrote the first book, the Understanding Modern Money book, I sent the draft to Robert Heilbronner, who um, I think sold more uh, economics books than any other author. Very uh, nice guy. He called me up, and I was trying to get him to write a blurb for, for the book. And he told me, I can't write a blurb for this book. He said, I'm not saying this wrong. He said, um, you know, money is the scariest topic there is. And he said, and your book is going to scare the hell out of everyone. <laughs> and and uh, he was being completely honest, right, when you hear the federal government spends by issuing currency and can't run out. The first reaction from everyone is not, oh, that's good. We can afford full employment. The first reaction is, you know, terror. <laughs> Let's not tell anyone, right? Please don't let them know. Because there's this great fear that the elected representatives will use that information and start spending like crazy. I think this is completely wrong. And, and it's not because I love politicians. I just don't think there's any evidence for this whatsoever. I think that the, the thing they fear more than anything is inflation. Because the population hates inflation. And so I think that the knowledge that you could spend more is not going to cause them to go crazy spending more. Okay? And, and I, I'm not trying to argue that they ought to be spending a lot more. I think we do need to be careful about inflation. And if we decide to spend more, we always need to think about how might this impact the rate of inflation. Because people hate inflation. It, it might be a largely irrational fear. And so we can work on that. We can try to make people understand that uh, actually inflation is not the worst possible um, outcome that we could face. That actually unemployed resources that lead to economic waste, deteriorating families, higher crime rates, incarceration, is much worse than having inflation of two or three percentage points more than what we have. Um, but that's really not the way people are thinking right now. So you don't want to scare them. You know, and we need to be a lot more careful in how we phrase things depending on who you're talking to, so that you don't scare them, so they'll be open to understanding what you're trying to say. Um, the, about the, the people in power, um, oh, well, I, I will come back to the tax thing. Um, it's hard to be optimistic, I have to admit. It is very hard to be optimistic about uh, state of democracy and whether our elected representatives and 
actually are trying to do things that benefit the people they represent. Um, I think you can see places where they are. I, I'm extremely critical of Obama in lots of areas, but I think there have been some areas in which he has tried to improve things. And, and I think things have, um, I would say even uh, from the 1950s when I was a kid to today, there's vast improvement in America. I think there are lots of areas where there hasn't been much improvement and maybe even deterioration. Poverty is worse today than it was in the 50s, for example. But uh, the um, socially, things have improved tremendously. The environment my kids lived through school is completely different from what I lived through. So I think we have improved. Um, so it's not completely hopeless. I think policymakers have played a positive role in some areas. Anyway, that's completely outside what I do. I'm not a political scientist at all. Taxes as um, punitive, well, I mean, you know, nobody wants to pay taxes. Um, say, taxes are the cost of civilization. That's what people say. I would say, you know, if, if you want a monetary system, we need something to drive it. And duping dopes is not going to work. I mean. If duping dopes will work, bitcoins will succeed. Because that is a system based strictly on duping dopes. Okay, so if, if bitcoin succeeds, which many people think it will, and it will gradually take over, and we won't use a dollar anymore, okay, then duping dopes will drive a monetary system. I think this is completely wrong. I think the dupes are uh, going to lose. Uh, that system will not function. Uh, so anyway, we need something to drive the tax system. Now, some taxes, uh, as we were saying at lunch, I think are really bad. Taxing work is a really bad idea. The payroll tax, it'd be very hard to think of a worse tax. It's not progressive. Everyone pays the, the same rate up to the cap, and then there's no tax at all. So if you're high income, you know, you start celebrating, I guess if your income's high enough, in March or April, you don't pay any more payroll tax. Okay, so it's bad in that sense. It taxes work, but we want people to work. So why are you taxing them? It taxes em em employers who employ people. But hold it, you want them to employ people. So why are we taxing them? It favors moving jobs outside America. Okay, why would you want to do that? It favors replacing people with robots. Why would you want to do that? So it has lots of bad effects. So that is a bad tax. Taxing corporations is a bad idea. And you know, I'm, I'm almost the only progressive economist who thinks that raising the corporate tax would be a, a bad idea. Everyone else thinks it's a great idea. It's the typical progressive tax. Uh, it's a bad tax. Again, it causes corporations to move out of the United States or to cut, try to cut special deals. Give me the tax break and I will build a factory in your community. We ought to just get rid of the tax. Level the playing field. No corporate taxes. Instead, uh, if we wanted to, we can tax the owners. So we impute all, of the rev all, all the profits to the owners of the corporation and tax them as income. Okay. Um, the income tax is uh, probably not a uh, terrible tax. I think there's better taxes. Okay? Uh, so I like taxing bads. So pollution, alcohol, tobacco, uh, maybe financial transactions, which is another popular progressive tax. Um, those tax bad behavior. Ideally, they eliminate the bad behavior. So. The goal of a bad tax is to get rid of the behavior. So the ideal is to have no revenue at all. So you tax smoking out of existence, then there's no tobacco tax revenue at all. Okay. Um, the uh, 
ideal tax to drive a currency is a broad-based tax that cannot be avoided. That's the ideal. Taxing income won't work when you're trying to monetize an economy. The European colonizers found that out. They went down to Africa, you impose an income tax, nobody has income, they have no incentive to get an income, it doesn't work. So they said, ah, we need to tax, impose a tax they can't avoid, so we have a hut tax. You tax the huts. They gotta live somewhere, okay? It will drive a currency, it's very effective. So we could have a hut tax, or house tax. And uh, you want to make it progressive, so you make it square feet. You want to make it environmentally friendly, you make it cubic feet. Because you got to heat and cool cubic feet of airspace. So I think this is an excellent tax. We should have a cubic feet of um, housing tax to drive the currency. You, and finally, uh, you, you don't want to um, allow accumulation of family fortunes. At least I don't. Uh, dynasties. So you have an a inheritance tax uh, with a goal of essentially wiping out the inheritance. So it should be very high. Um, you, know, you can have a, a exempt amount, a you know, million dollars or whatever, but uh, to get the high wealth. So those are the kinds of taxes that I would advocate. So you need to drive it, but then again, you also want to change behavior and you want it to be progressive. Okay, last, um, the rest of the world. So the U, right now, in the global economy, we have a handful of international reserve currencies. Uh, all the dollars, Canadian, Australian, and American dollars, the UK, the uh, Japanese yen, and increasingly Chinese RMB. So these are gonna be the global uh, currencies for the foreseeable future. There is a huge international demand for all of these. Uh, uh, even though Australia is a tiny country, you wouldn't think that it was uh, an international reserve currency. International Global pension funds decided to diversify to include Australia. Okay, and so suddenly there's a huge external demand for the Australian uh, dollar, and that makes it possible for all of these countries to import beyond what they export, okay? And China is a net exporter, but it will change very soon. Uh, it could be within a year, they will change. So um, countries that face a huge external demand can run a current account deficit. For how long? As long as the rest of the world wants a dollar. Okay. How long will this go on? Forever? Probably not. Eventually, China is going to want to stop net exporting to the U.S. They'll probably net, net import from the U.S. Uh, luxury goods. And so, uh, and vacations in the United States. If we, we could immediately get that, right? All we have to do is make it easier for Chinese to come to America. And we could have a, start running a trade uh, surplus uh, with China. It's just a policy decision. Um, so it will gradually turn around. The U.S. will uh, gradually move more toward a current account um, balance. Uh, are, do we face insolvency or the rest of the world suddenly deciding to run out of dollars? No, we don't face that. The, the Chinese, it looks like they're um, gradually reducing their accumulation of treasuries and maybe diversifying into some other currencies, the transition will be slow. First, because the Chinese realize what will happen to the value of the dollar and to the value of their treasuries if they suddenly try to dump them. So they're not going to do that. They want to maintain a relatively strong dollar and relatively weaker RMB, and that requires that they're very careful in how they unload um, the treasuries. The uh, dollar will remain the main international reserve currency for longer than anyone expects. That's my prediction. The UK pound remained the international currency long after the US took over as the most important country in the world and the largest economy in the world. Um, 
the, the dollar will remain the dominant currency longer than people expect. But then we will come to the day eventually when the dollar will um, uh, be in less demand globally. Is that a huge problem? No, most Americans would think that's a good thing. Okay? The rest of the world is going to want to buy stuff from the United States. That's a good thing. Uh, Americans might have to get jobs. They might have to. So we went over here. Might have to, um, you know, start working and producing stuff for domestic consumption. I don't see that as a bad thing. So I, I don't think that we're going to, you know, wake up one morning and have a crisis. I think it will be very gradual. Our trade um, deficit will gradually decline. Our um, uh, trading partner standard of living. China and Southeast Asia, maybe in India, is going to be rising, uh, so that the um, our wages won't be so high relative to theirs as their standard of living goes up. So I think it will be a gradual thing. The next financial crisis, there's going to be a huge run in, into the dollar again, and I think that will be the pattern we're going to see for a long time. Every time there's a crisis, the run will be into the dollar, not out of it. When we get scared, the dollar will be in higher demand, not lower demand. So I'm not uh, worried about a crisis um, when the dollar is replaced by some other currency. People think, people used to think it would be the euro, which was laughable because. First, if you understood the problem within the euro, you knew that they were going to have a severe crisis which they could not handle. But the, the second reason is because for a currency to become an international reserve currency, the rest of the world has to be able to get it. You can't get euros because Euroland as a whole basically runs balanced trade. Within Europe, you have lots of trading, so Germany has a huge surplus and uh, most of the nations have huge deficits against Germany. But taken as a whole, Euroland runs small surpluses. The only other way to get them is to borrow them. But borrowing the international reserve currency is a lot less desirable than um, earning it by selling. Uh, there was a time when uh, London was the international lender, and so the, the pound really maintained its international reserve currency through lending. Okay, but now, uh, countries are um, uh, much, much prefer to export to get the currency. With um, globalization of trade and bringing down trade barriers, it's much easier to get currency that way. So Euro land is not a possibility. China is not a possibility right now. China doesn't want that role. I know that. Some Chinese talk about it, and they're trying to get more of their trade denominated in RMB. But if you're the international, international, the primary international reserve currency, you have to behave in a completely different way. When the crisis hit, the Fed had to originate 29 trillion dollars in loans. 29 trillion. 40 percent of that was to Europe. Okay. Is China going to do that? No. They're, they are not prepared to be the international lender of last resort. So Britain used to do that, now it's the U.S. responsibility. And so because of that, and because we have a Fed that has demonstrated its willingness to do it, in spite of however much Congress might hate this, uh, you know, we proved we will do it. And so I think that also uh, really strengthens the um, place of the dollar as the international reserve currency. If the Fed had said no, then maybe uh, we could see a uh, move to try to get out of the dollar. But we didn't do that. And, and the Fed is, is doing it again. I mean, it's continued to do it as Europe has needed dollars. The Fed has said, yeah, we will open that, that window again. Well, I already have one question, but let's do it. So thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, Professor Ray Rand, thank you for just taking the time to be with us.
uh, you know, Professor Ray's coming to us from New York with a, a newborn child, and he's taking his time out to be here because he had promised a long time ago. So it's just very special. So, okay. uh, so thank you again. Yeah, and let's wrap up.